In Chapter 1, we chose a theory of happiness, Dan Habern's Emotional State Theory. Happiness is an emotional condition consisting of three dimensions of central affective states and your mood propensity. Psychic affirmation is when all levels are favorable on the whole. You experience the negative only to a minor extent. Psychic flourishing is what we might call truly happy. It's a pronounced state of happiness that only occurs when individual, environment, and context are in perfect harmony. Over the next several episodes, we'll be building upon our definition of happiness, integrating it into a big framework of sorts. Happiness is deeply connected to other major aspects of our lives, and to learn about happiness is to learn about them, too. The first step in building that framework is to look at the foundations of happiness. In this episode, we'll be putting the foundations in context in sections 1 and 2, then introducing and talking about the foundations, and finally, some conclusions. Let's get into it. Nature and nurture are always influencing each other in a back and forth at all times, but genes play a larger role than most people realize. They make some contribution to almost every trait. The initial organization of the brain does not depend that much on experience, writes cognitive scientist Gary Marcus. Nature provides the first draft, which experience then revises. Built in doesn't mean unmalleable. It means organized in advance of experience. This is to say that genes are not blueprints. They don't form a human into some predetermined, unmalleable structure. They're closer to recipes or a set of instructions that produce a person over time. They don't predetermine, they preconfigure. A set of identical twins, for example, are baked from the same recipe, so they end up being pretty similar, but not identical. Fraternal twins, on the other hand, only share half the same recipe, and can therefore end up being radically different. To determine how much genes influence a particular trait, scientists have done studies comparing these two groups. Because both sets grew up in the same time and place, the environment is held constant. Therefore, if a trait is significantly influenced by genes, you would expect identical twins to show more similarity on that trait compared to fraternal twins. And indeed, in just about every trait, identical twins are more similar, meaning that genes make some contribution to almost every trait. One of those traits is your average level of happiness, known as your affective style, and identical twin studies have shown it's a highly heritable aspect of personality. In other words, genes seem to have a substantial impact on happiness. Consider the identical twin sisters Daphne and Barbara, who were separated at birth and met each other for the first time when they were 40. They discovered they both had the same taste in clothes, both had left school at 14, both worked in local government, and both had the same fears. They also suffered miscarriages at the same time and had two boys and one girl. But the kicker? They both giggle uncontrollably. It's so natural to laugh. It's like breathing. <laughs> We're happy. Oh, yeah. You know, it's just as easy as that. You little mermaid there. <laughs> The influence of genetics on happiness makes its way into the media quite a bit, and they'll often say, everyone has a happiness set point determined by their genes, and whatever you do, good or bad, you will return to that set point. But that's not the claim psychologists have made. They've said that everyone has a set range, and particular sources of happiness will move us up and down within that range. Let's consider that these particular sources lead to our definition of happiness. A good way to think about it is attunement moving the line up and down, and the more ephemeral aspects of happiness as waves diverging from that line. So your resting state of happiness can change, and your overall level of happiness can become particularly pronounced in certain situations. Many have raised skepticism over how much genes influence happiness, and I expect that debate will rage for some time to come. However, I don't think anyone holds that genes determine our destinies, or that we can't change our lasting levels of happiness. It may just mean that if your genetic temperament is Squidward, you probably won't become a SpongeBob. There is a caveat to the genetic set range. Not everything that happens in our lives has a lasting effect on our happiness. That is to say, some conditions move the line up for an extended period of time, and others don't. 
You've probably heard of hedonic adaptation. Person gets a new car, it makes them happy for a bit, but over time, the car becomes part of their everyday life, they adapt to it, and they return to baseline happiness. Now, if you're like me, you wanna say, yeah, that's those people. We call them losers. I'm different. A brand new car would make me super happy forever. I don't care what you have to say. But studies show over and over again that people are terrible at predicting how they'll feel in the future. Psychologist Dan Gilbert has a great book called Stumbling on Happiness, in which he talks about how bad we are at affective forecasting, or predicting how we'll feel in the future. We overestimate, by a huge margin, the intensity and duration of our emotional reactions. Whether it be an event, a purchase, an achievement, or even something negative like a bad grade, the pleasure or displeasure we feel in relation to that thing is usually much smaller and shorter than we think it's going to be. One reason we're so bad at affective forecasting is that we don't realize we adapt to most things. Adaptation is, in part, just how neurons work. Nerve cells respond strongly to new stimuli, but over time they habituate and fire much less to the stimuli they've gotten used to. They're built to recognize changes in the environment, not steady states. Imagine walking down your street for the first time versus walking down your street for the thousandth time. It is, at first, novel and interesting, but after a while it fades into the background of your life. An interesting thing to note here is that adaptation isn't all that bad. It points to the fact that humans are incredibly resilient, and we probably underestimate our ability to bounce back from adversity. But the other side of adaptation kind of sucks. It's what psychologists call the hedonic treadmill. The hedonic treadmill refers to our tendency to pursue goals, purchases, and expectations because we think they'll make us happy. When we finally get them, it's not long before we hedonically adapt, and those achievements no longer bring happiness. So we quickly recalibrate, setting higher goals, purchases, and expectations with the hope that they will bring us lasting happiness. And the cycle continues ad infinitum, pursuing, achieving, and ending up back to where we were. We're like hamsters on a wheel. As Adam Smith wrote in 1759, in every permanent situation where there is no expectation of change, the mind of every man, in a longer or shorter time, returns to its natural and usual state of tranquility. In prosperity, after a certain time, it falls back to that state. In adversity, after a certain time, it rises up to it. So it's important that we differentiate the things that we adapt to from the things that we don't adapt to. As such, the foundations of happiness, what we will be talking about for the remainder of this episode, are those things not subject to adaptation. They make a lasting difference. When they're good, they'll move us up in our set range. When they're deficient, they'll move us down in our set range. The SOARS model is going to be our set of foundations. Like our definition of happiness, this model also comes from Habern, but it owes a debt to some other thinkers who we will meet soon. The first foundation is security. If you're constantly in a state of peril, it's quite hard to be happy. But Habern points out we can't speak objectively here because it's really people's perception of security that matters. If I went down a half pipe, I would freak out. But for people like Tony Hawk, it's an activity that increases his happiness. Habern split security up into a few categories, the first of which is material security. The two main threads here are one, poverty brings unhappiness no matter what country you live in, and two, the effect of money on happiness seems to plateau at a point of perceived security. In the US, that plateau seems to occur around a household income of $90,000, but it will of course vary from country to country. As we all know, wealth is a ticket to freedom from the pressures of the external world, and it can therefore bring you a great deal of peace. That is, if you let it. Some researchers say that money makes two groups unhappy, the poor and the very wealthy. The wealthy worry about losing it, they worry about how it's being used and invested, and they raise their expectations about how happy they should be, ironically making them feel less secure. Or, as Biggie said, the more money we come across, the more problems we see. And while wealth technically provides people with more options, it can paradoxically lead you towards a narrow set of culturally constructed, or this is what rich people do, options. As writer Nassim Taleb points out, when people get rich, they lose control of their preferences, substituting constructed preferences for their own, complicating their lives unnecessarily, triggering their own misery. And these constructed preferences are, of course, the preferences of those who want to sell them something. 
At the end of the day, I don't think anyone has any doubt that wealth softens some of your rougher edges or that wealth isn't preferable to the alternatives. It just won't magically solve internal problems. There are plenty of miserable rich people who can tell you that. Then we have project security. When you identify deeply with a goal or career, the fear of failure can be a deep source of unhappiness. You're not gonna make it. Everybody works harder than you. A small child gets more views in one video than you've gotten in your entire career. His name is Ryan Toys Review. Is that a tsunami? Uh-oh. But again, it all comes down to perception. A startup might be an incredibly risky endeavor, but a founder can feel great about it day in and day out, and even if she ends up failing, she may perceive it as having been worthwhile and meaningful, with little damage to her sense of self. Finally, there's time security, feeling like you have time to do what you need to do. Those who don't have time security tend to be the most compressed people. They rush through their day, worried about deadlines and other responsibilities. People with no time security also tend to be reactive to everything and appreciative of little, because everything gets sucked into the orbit of the thing they're stressed about. Perception, however, creeps in again. It can be exhilarating for an author, for example, to race to the finish on the last chapter of his book, due to the publisher next week. Though chronic stress, like an overbearing boss who imposes unreasonable deadlines, is unlikely to be remedied by perception. Security is a deficit need, which means it only seems to affect our happiness when we don't have it. After a certain point, it's unlikely that more of it adds to our happiness. The only thing that more security does, as with something like material security, is serve as a larger barrier to unhappiness. The rich are protected from the pains of debt, tuitions, and bills. But security is a double-edged sword. Not having enough of it can lead to unhappiness, but so can having too much. A lot has been said in recent years about coddled childhoods. Growing up overly protected and comfortable can leave people unprepared to deal with conflict and setbacks, and it can engender a deep fear of going out into the world. What many consider to be natural parts of living suddenly become earth-shattering events. It's my own personal opinion that when it comes to happiness, it's more important to be good at dealing with adversity and uncertainty than reaching the heights of safety and luxury. But a baseline of security on all counts is obviously important. The next part of the model is outlook. One of the most famous lines to come out of the ancient world is from Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius. The whole universe is change and life itself is but what you deem it. The main idea being that events only affect us through our interpretations of them. So if we can control our interpretations, we can control our world. This idea is at the center of all outlooks and mindsets. And philosophers and self-help gurus alike have argued endlessly about which types of outlooks are best for happiness. Aurelius himself was a Stoic, and they believed that happiness depended entirely on a virtuous character. A pronounced version of such a virtuous character, the Stoic Sage, is a person who has achieved a constant state of apathia, or a mind completely unperturbed by external events and inner passions. The Buddha believed the same peaceful mind could be achieved by eliminating craving, the root of all suffering, through non-attachment. In the Stoic and Buddhist view, happiness is entirely within the individual's control. It comes down to mind training and mastering our interpretations. Same problem, same tragedy can be much different how you see it. This angle, you can see something very bad. From this angle, oh, okay. This all may sound like a hard task, and that's because it is, but you don't need to go full Stoic and Buddhist to benefit from their advice. For example, Will writes his first blog post and gets some very critical responses. They make him feel dumb, and he never wants to write a blog post again. Time to deem this differently. Will, you're not dumb, you're inexperienced. There's plenty of room to become a more competent writer, and constructive criticism is a part of growing. Plus, there were just as many encouraging comments as there were critical ones. And dude, your first blog post got responses. I'm still a total amateur at this kind of stuff but I've gotten pretty good at reinterpreting situations to bring me peace of mind. The thing is, is I have to still put a lot of conscious effort into it. 
One of the goals of Buddhist mind training is to make those responses automatic, to respond effortlessly in happier ways. Indeed, hearing Aurelius and the Dalai Lama say, life is what you deem it, so deem it in ways that bring you happiness, will not suddenly endow you with a happier outlook and thought process. Alex changed. I'm happier now. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you, Mr. Lama. A person with chronic depression, for example, may be no more able to will themselves into happy interpretations than turn themselves into a blimp. And unless you're born with a happy-go-lucky temperament, Outlook can take a long time to master. There are several episodes that get into how Outlooks change throughout the series, but in general, Outlooks only change after 1. A long period of mind training, such as a several years long meditation practice, 2. A paradigm shifting emotional event, such as a cancer diagnosis that impels someone to live life to the fullest, or 3. Deciding to change your values and actively putting the new ones into practice for a long time, such as a person who changes their top value from achievement to gratitude, commits their attention to appreciation, and over time, gratefulness becomes part of their identity. None of these are easy for the average person, let alone the depressed one, and it can take months to years of work on various strategies to cultivate a happier outlook. Training the mind is no different from learning any other skill. It requires perseverance, enthusiasm, and regular practice over time. Despite the recent craze in mindfulness and the big revival of stoicism, I still think we underestimate the power of mind training. Lifetime meditators have shown impressive feats of control over their internal states, such as a zero startle response to a gunshot and being able to raise the temperature in their fingers and toes by 17 degrees in freezing weather. Not only that, but it's been shown that lifetime meditators experience positive emotion at a full standard deviation from the norm. Again though, this is not some trivial amount of work. Calling it a choice, like eating a donut is a choice, is minimizing how much practice and skill it takes. Outlook is a huge topic. It's our beliefs and values, it's how we perceive and interpret things, how we respond to situations, and it's where we focus our attention. Our emotional state plays a major role too. Outlook influences state, state influences outlook. The emotional state we're concerned with is happiness. So what outlooks are the most conducive to it? Well, with 7 billion humans who hold a plurality of beliefs and values, you're going to get a plurality of answers. But anyone familiar with the philosophy of happiness knows of three outlooks that come up a lot. The first is acceptance. Acceptance means not getting up in arms when things don't meet your expectations. Accepting things as they are and not trying to control them, whatever they be. Internal feelings of anger, happiness, fear, jealousy, anxiety, or external events that don't go exactly as we wish. A couple of writers sum up this outlook in pithy ways, such as Tim Urban from the blog Wait But Why, with his equation, happiness equals reality minus expectations. Yeah, well, if happiness is reality minus expectations. <laughs> <laughs> That's great too. Another good one comes from writer Mark Manson. The desire for a more positive experience is itself a negative experience, and paradoxically, the acceptance of one's negative experience is itself a positive experience. But my favorite metaphor comes from Buddhist writer Noah Rusheda. Imagine watching someone playing a game of Tetris, and every time a new shape appears, they go into a tantrum and yell and scream at the game. That was not the shape I expected. That's not the shape I wanted. Sounds pretty stupid, right? And yet, that's how a lot of people, myself included, go through life. We demand that everything goes exactly the way we want it to, asking the external world to conform to our will. But much like the game of Tetris, the external world has a funny way of never going exactly as we wish. It is full of incompetence, imperfection, and chance. Without acceptance, you will be a slave to your expectations, and your happiness will rise and fall in accordance with whether they are met or not. A lot of people say, well, you want to be adversely affected by outcomes because then it will encourage you to change the problem for the better. Thinking otherwise is defeatist. This is a misunderstanding of the concept. Acceptance does not mean resignation. Acceptance exists in the space between stimulus and action. Someone who is reactive, for example, receives a stimulus that doesn't meet their expectations and immediately gets upset. Someone who practices acceptance gets hit with a stimulus, accepts it, and then has the freedom to respond in a multitude of ways. This is not resignation, it is freedom from reactivity. To understand this distinction further, consider the example of an alcoholic. In Alcoholics Anonymous, the first step in their 12-step program is admitting that one cannot control one's addiction. 
That's acceptance, not resignation. One can accept what they cannot change, but not resign themselves to hopelessness. So observing things for what they are does not rule out working to make things better or having high hopes. Here are just a few people who have openly said they practice acceptance. They're not exactly underachievers. The second outlook that's conducive to happiness is positivity. Looking for silver linings, expressing gratitude, laughing at mistakes rather than letting them destroy your psyche. Positivity gets a bum rap because it's often associated with magical thinking or delusional self-belief. Things like The Secret. Do you know what this bitch says the secret of life is? She said it was positive imagery. The bitch fly to Africa and telling them starving children that shit. What's wrong with you? I have not eaten in five days. Well, what you need to do is visualize some roast beef and some mashed potatoes and gravy. Oh, please, bitch, you're killing me. Stop talking like that. No, 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 no. The problem is you have a bad attitude about starving to death. <laughs> The secret is what we might call thoughtless optimism, the belief that everything will work out no matter what happens. But just as bad as thoughtless pessimism, everything is screwed and nothing is going to work out. So it's probably best not to write the extremes of optimism or pessimism. But I personally believe that positivity and negativity are self-fulfilling prophecies, so I'd much rather live the positive life. At the end of the day, it's not an all or nothing thing with this stuff. You can be optimistic in most situations, and then be pessimistic in potentially catastrophic situations. It's probably not a good idea to be optimistic that a dangerous thunderstorm will pass while you're out on the golf course. The third outlook that's conducive to happiness is compassion. The Dalai Lama has spent his whole life talking about this one, so I'll let him do the heavy lifting here. But the real attitude here, just think oneself. So, think only oneself, then even tiny problem appears unbearable. If your attitude, think others' well-being, then when others is infinite. So think more about others' well-being, your mind open, widened. Then your own problem appears not significant, insignificant. Therefore, the compassionate attitude really widened. So one's own problem, then uh, not much sort of seriousness. So that, I think, makes differences our inner peace. According to Buddhist teaching, a self-centered attitude leads us to constant competition with others. This, in turn, breeds jealousy, which leads to distrust, which then leads to frustration and fear, and ultimately ends in loneliness and alienation. Only through a compassionate attitude can you escape the mind's constant desire to compare itself to others and merge with something larger than the self. I think there are other important outlooks for happiness, and you'll see them peppered in throughout the series, but for now, those three are good. The final three aspects of SOARS are autonomy, relationships, and SCOTR. You need me in your life to be happy. Just kidding. Skilled and meaningful work. It's, uh, it's skilled and meaningful work. A prominent theory in psychology, Edward D.C. and Richard Ryan's self-determination theory, matches up with each of these. And since self-determination theory will play a major role going forward, let's talk about it. Self-determination theory, or SDT, is a broad macro theory in psychology focused on human motivation and flourishing. There are good reasons to be skeptical of any theory that attempts to explain human flourishing. It's not a uh, small topic. And the field of psychology is amidst a replication crisis, with as many as half of all papers failing to replicate. In short, psychology is not without its major detractors. So, if you have reservations about psychology, I feel ya. STT is promising, though. It has an impressive replication track record and has been proven to be empirically robust across cultures and life domains over a 50-year period of research. And because of this, it's now considered to be the superior model of human motivation, dethroning the ever-popular Maslow's hierarchy. Also, it has a lot in common with the ancient philosophy that we've discussed thus far, so I'm willing to put my eggs in its basket. 
SDT posits that humans have three universal psychological needs. Autonomy, the feeling that one's actions are fully self-endorsed rather than controlled or coerced. Competence, the feeling of growth and mastery in our skill sets, our environment, and our social worlds. And relatedness, the feeling that one matters and belongs. Now, when SDT speaks of needs, it doesn't mean Will needs a third sports car or Will needs butter on those buns. I need butter on these buns! It means something that is essential to the growth and wellness of a human. In this way, autonomy, competence, and relatedness are for us like the sun, water, and soil are for plants. When we get them, we thrive. When we don't get them, we wither. It doesn't matter if you think they're important or not. If you don't fulfill them, you will experience impaired health, happiness, and motivation. We are therefore universally endowed with these needs by nature. They are not acquired. So we have the SOARS model and self-determination theory. And as you can see, the last three letters of SOARS match up with the universal psychological needs of SDT. In other words, each of the universal psychological needs from SDT is a foundation of happiness. Let's start with autonomy, which matches with autonomy. I think we all know that the times when we feel a sense of control over our lives, when what we do is self-determined, are happier times than when we feel coerced or subject to another's will. Freedom is a potent source of happiness, and a quick look at history will show that a need for it runs deep in human nature. But we have to be careful with our words here, because freedom as autonomy is not quite the same as freedom as individualism, freedom as options, or freedom as independence. Autonomy is the extent to which people experience their behavior as volitional or as fully self-endorsed, rather than being coerced, compelled, or seduced by forces external to the self. Actions that people fully stand behind, that are experienced as congruent expressions of one's authentic interests and values, are autonomous actions. So what makes that different from independence? In SDT, independence means you don't rely on anyone for help or guidance. It is self-reliance. One can therefore be autonomously independent, such as a fisherman who self-endorses their solitude, or autonomously dependent, such as a teenager who volitionally turns to their parents for guidance. Autonomy is often conflated with Western-style individualism as well, but they aren't quite the same either. Consider someone who identifies closely with a community, like their local church. Such membership seems to come with limits to autonomy, moral expectations, and accepting a certain order of things. Yet, because this person is so identified with the community, that changes what they want to do. They endorse its values and therefore follow the community's rules and customs autonomously. Here you see how autonomy gets a bit nuanced. You can be autonomous in a non-individualistic way, living with the volitional choice to give greater weight to communal concerns. Finally, you don't need options to be autonomous. If the teacher says that the homework is to read a chapter of Don Quixote, a student doesn't have a choice. But since the student values learning for its own sake and loves reading, they self-endorse doing the homework. One can still feel autonomous even in the absence of choice. It depends on one's attitude toward the mandated activity. Attitude and perception matter a lot when it comes to autonomy. Two people can be in the exact same environment and perceive their autonomy differently. In his book Man's Search for Meaning, Viktor Frankl tells his story of living in a concentration camp during the Holocaust. Frankl realized that he had no freedom in the everyday use of the term, but his captors could not take away his choice. Everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. He chose to see the beauty of the sunrise, to make up humorous stories for his fellow inmates, to accept the punishment promised after he helped a fellow prisoner, and he chose to share his food with others. The Nazis could not take away his perception of freedom, his autonomy. Now, Frankl's story should not be used to discount the importance of the environment. Some environments are obviously more supportive of autonomy than others. In the US, entrepreneurs tend to be much happier than corporate employees for the simple reason that not having a boss affords you a great deal of autonomy. One famous study looked at the effect of autonomy in a nursing home. One floor was given choice over what plants to buy, where to put them, and put in charge of their family visits, the scheduling of movie nights, as well as other responsibilities. The other floor had no choice. All of these things were done for them. Over a period of 18 months, the floor that was provided with choice became much more active, healthier, and happier than the choiceless floor. 
In a review of the studies on autonomy supportive environments, Judith Rodin and Jonathan Haidt concluded that changing an institution's environment to increase the sense of control among its workers, students, patients, or other users was one of the most effective possible ways to increase their sense of engagement, energy, and happiness. There is a tension here that we need to address. One of the needs is autonomy, and another is relatedness. Aren't they contradictory? Don't you have to give up your autonomy to be related to others? Well, it is a tension, but it's not a contradiction. The earlier example I gave of the man who supports his church is both autonomous and related. To give you another example, imagine a kid who has gone to a secular summer camp for his entire childhood, and over time he has become deeply integrated into its community. The camp has all kinds of rules, values, and mandatory activities, yet he endorses all of them. He's met his best friends there and considers it a home away from home. Now that he is older, he volitionally spends his time there as a counselor. He could spend the summer working for a business and make lots of money, but instead he chooses to work at the camp for very little pay. He believes the place helps kids become better people and works there for selfless motives. He is both autonomous and related. Now, this doesn't mean that autonomy and relatedness can't conflict. A deep need to be part of a community can cause people to join groups they don't really identify with. A star athlete might feel social pressure to spend all of his time with the other jocks at school, even though he doesn't really like them at all. He thinks it would hurt his image if he hung out with the theater kids, even though that's what he wants to do. He is not living with volition, but rather with an internalized pressure that jock is the image and status expected of him. These distinctions are not easy to parse, and autonomy is a tough concept to get a handle on. When I was first researching SDT, I thought, well, if we just let everyone be autonomous, wouldn't that result in a sort of chaotic permissiveness? Until, of course, I got to the sentence in Ed Deasy's book, Why We Do What We Do, it cannot be emphasized enough that autonomy support is not the same thing as permissiveness. Okay, so what does he mean? Well, autonomy support exists in between cold and controlling environments and chaotic permissive ones. Let's use parenting as an example. Will loves playing video games with his friends. A set of cold and controlling parents may want Will to become a banker and thinks this is a waste of time. They don't let him play at all and force him into math-based extracurriculars, a subject he dislikes. A permissive parent, on the other hand, may let Will do any old thing, like letting him play games at the expense of his schoolwork and health. An autonomy supportive parent would know that he loves video games and would set aside time for him to play, but provide structure as well allowing him to game as long as he does well in school, gets outdoors, and comes to family meals. Here you see how autonomy support is a combination of well-communicated limits and choice. Will is given autonomy, and if he decides to use his autonomy to transgress the limits set by his rents, supporting his autonomy would actually mean making sure he deals with the consequences. In this way, you should be able to see that supporting autonomy is actually a form of promoting responsibility, not permissiveness. You give an agent autonomy, Autonomy, their choices are on them. It's worth clarifying this connection a little bit further and solidifying why autonomy and permissiveness shouldn't be equated. Remember that humans have a basic psychological need for relatedness, and because we have this need, we are naturally led to become part of groups. And these groups, for better or worse, open people up to being socialized. Belonging to said groups become part of one's identity, and people naturally accept its values and customs. And this, says DC, is in large part the process through which responsibility develops. We put stock in the humanistic belief that it is important to be authentic to be oneself, to march to one's own drummer. But just as obviously, we put stock in the importance of being responsible. To advocate autonomy does not mean to call for self-indulgence, because being truly oneself involves accepting responsibility for the well-being of others. The need to feel related leads people naturally to take on and assimilate aspects of the culture that can result in their making fertile contributions, and autonomy support from significant others helps this to occur. That is what being socialized means, at least in the positive and healthy sense of that term. Because being true to oneself has often been equated with the egoistic doing of one's own thing, authenticity has often been perversely interpreted as justification for irresponsibility and then attacked by the critics who so interpret it. The selfish, egoistic doing of one's own thing is in fact irresponsible and may have demonstrably negative consequences. Note here that the responsibility is on both groups and individuals. It is up to groups to provide a strong set of values, and it is up to the members of those groups to give psychological support 
so that individuals internalize those values. It is then up to individuals to accept those responsibilities. If these are aligned, you're likely to have a very happy individual. But if a group is controlling, doesn't provide opportunities to get better, and doesn't instill a sense of belonging and significance, individuals will, one, stay and be deeply unhappy or defiant, two, go their own way, or three, find a different group. Likewise, if an individual is selfish and egocentric, they may not accept responsibility in even the best environments. Either way, the greater the alignment, the happier the individual. You may remain confused about autonomy's relationship with relatedness, and that's fine. It's something that pervades every episode from here on out, so as we go, you'll get a firmer grasp on it. The key to understanding it for now is that the self is complex enough to avoid both selfishness and conformity. An authentic person can fill many roles within one identity, but to remain authentic is simply not to be forced into any of them. I hope all of this makes it clear that autonomy is not the same as individualism, independence, or having options, and autonomy does not necessarily conflict with collectivism. It can exist or not exist in all contexts, even if those contexts have marked differences. One final thing here. I don't think anyone believes that autonomy can be ever present. Living on the earth requires you to do things without full volition sometimes. As members of society, we have norms, requirements, and rules, and some of them we self-endorse and some we don't. Everybody is part of this crazy dialectic dance between agency and constraint. The trick with autonomy is to bring it into your life as much as possible. Next up is relatedness, which matches up with relationships. The strength of your relationships and sense of connectedness with others are widely considered to be the greatest predictors of happiness. Relatedness is strongest when you're interacting and socially connecting often, when you feel integrated into a community, and when you have a sense of significance in caring for or contributing to that community. Whether it's family, friends, or a larger group, being in the company of others usually ranks near the top of people's lists of activities that bring them happiness, even for introverts. Of course, it's not just any old group of people. Feeling truly connected in relationships requires respect, caring, mutual understanding, seeing each other as worthwhile, and trust. If you can't trust someone, then it's pretty hard to feel accepted and loved. As Habern points out, trust strongly correlates with happiness because of the sense of security it provides. I think we all know the feeling of being at home with another person or in a particular community where you can be yourself without thinking twice and share your deepest vulnerabilities and so on. Plus, with all these things in place, there are no barriers to playfully ribbing each other. One of my favorite activities. Hey man, you're looking good today. Oh. <laughs> Thanks. I, uh, I hadn't realized out of shape Indiana Jones was in vogue. Oh, fuck you. Talking about relationships and happiness probably has you going, yeah, no duh, dude. I'm here for knowledge, not platitudes. But if you're like me, there's a chance that you take these obvious things for granted. The writer Toni Morrison, for example, made me realize that things like unconditional love must be shown outwardly. I can't expect others to read my mind. It's interesting to see when a kid walks in the room, your child or anybody else's child, does your face light up? That's what they're looking for. When my children used to walk in the room when they were little, I looked at them to see if they had buckled their trousers, or if their hair was combed, or if their socks were up. And so you think your affection and your deep love is on display because you're caring for them. It's not. When they see you, they see the critical face. What's wrong now? Mm -hmm. But then, if you let your, as I tried from then on, to let your face speak what's in your heart, mm -hmm. because when they walked in the room, I was glad to see them. Mm -hmm. It's just as small as that. Interestingly enough, in his book Happiness, a very short introduction, Habern talks about this very idea. His great-grandmother raised his father, and his father's most vivid recollection of her parenting style? She simply paid attention. If he came in with something to say, she would lower her glasses and give him her full attention. That simple gesture demonstrated his worth to her and boosted his own sense of self-worth more than any heap of toys could. There is a darker side to the need for relatedness, which I pointed to with the jock example earlier. His fears over status and image kept him from being himself. 
And just like him, people will behave in all kinds of ways that they think people will like or will bring them success without ever feeling connected. And that sucks. The meaning and motives of a great deal of human behavior can be linked, either directly or indirectly, to the need for relatedness, from the readiness to engage in social rituals to preoccupations with image, status, or achievement. People motivated by the need for relatedness may put a life's worth of effort into looking beautiful, being rich, or doing what modern culture convinces them to do without ever feeling loved for themselves. It is not merely being admired that counts. Rather, people must have the perception that others care for them unconditionally. One reason I think celebrities experience it's lonely at the top is because they feel the love for them is contingent. Contingent on their level of fame and status and beauty, Contingent on the benefits they can bring their friends. Contingent on things that aren't really them. And it's not just celebrities who struggle with this problem. Some children have parents who judge their worth based on their grades and accomplishments. Others feel they are only as good as their recorded experiences and the responses they get. And most workplaces, despite being social in some sense, come with all kinds of contingencies that can make organic relationships hard. As you can see, there's a huge potential for relatedness to conflict with autonomy. It doesn't have to be that way, but it can. People can spend their entire lives acting in ways that feel controlled by forces external to the self. To be someone they're not, just to fit in or impress others. It's not hard to imagine what this does to feeling at home in life. Finally, we have competence, which matches with skilled and meaningful work. If you watch a two-year-old play, you'll see they just kind of go around messing with stuff. They don't need incentives for this. They have an intrinsic motivation to explore, manipulate objects, and understand their environments. Almost a century of psychological research has confirmed that humans have an innate need to feel effective and capable in all domains of life, to experience mastery in our physical and social worlds. In SDT, however, competence isn't merely effectiveness, but the experience of growth. You can be great at playing the Beatles song Blackbird over and over again, but if that's all you're doing, you're not really developing any skills or stretching yourself with challenges. Your need for competence is not being satisfied. Competence should therefore be seen as an asymptote, a straight line that a curve approaches but never reaches. In other words, it's something you're always working toward but never arrive. It's the athlete that spends years shaving a few more seconds off their sprint, and once they've done it, they go back and keep trying to shave off more seconds. It's the YouTuber who keeps getting a little better at animation, the comedian who keeps refining their crowd work skills. It is a life of curiosity, learning, and getting better. As the poet William Butler Yeats put it, happiness is neither virtue nor pleasure nor this thing nor that, but simply growth. We are happy when we are growing. Competence, as with most of the stuff we talk about in regards to happiness, is all about the pursuit, not the arrival. If I made these videos for the sole purpose of that hour-long burst of joy I get when I hit the publish button, I'd be an idiot. Now, obviously competence doesn't have to come from work specifically. There's a lot of places people can grow. But, you know, since people spend a lot of time at work, it's important that your work allows you to build skills. The most obvious reason for this is that flow experiences arise when you match skill with challenge. If you play Blackbird over and over again, boredom is more likely than flow. It happens only when you push yourself and find that optimal balance. Growth is therefore a literal requirement for flow. Beyond growth, skill, and effectiveness, and their essential role in happiness and work, there's meaning, which also plays a pivotal role. It's hard to imagine anyone being happy if they didn't value their work and thought that it didn't matter. You can't experience value fulfillment if there isn't any perceived value. And while skill and growth can help experiences be meaningful, they can only get you so far. An attorney expertly arguing a dishonest case for a deplorable client might have flow experiences while doing it, but be left deflated and depressed at the end of it all. Playing video games can provide flow, but usually isn't very fulfilling, even if flow normally entails at least some sense of meaning due to the exercise of skill. Meaning is pretty subjective, and I believe it can be found in any job. But as Habern alludes to in that excerpt, some work environments can be more conducive to meaning than others. Watching a child grow into a better writer over time can be quite meaningful for a teacher. On the other hand, putting a single part on a circuit board over and over again can be extremely alienating. 
But when it comes to meaning, perception obviously matters a lot. JFK told a story that when visiting the NASA headquarters for the first time in 1961, he introduced himself to a janitor mopping the floor and asked him about his job. The janitor replied, I'm helping put a man on the moon. A similar story is told about architect Christopher Wren and the building of St. Paul's Cathedral in London. He walked by and asked a group of men working what each of them were doing. One said, I am cutting a piece of stone. The next said, I am earning five shillings, two pence a day. And the third said, I am helping Sir Christopher Wren build a beautiful cathedral. These stories may be apocryphal, but there are actually studies on how perceptions affect meaning and work. A famous study by Amy Resneski and Jane Dutton showed that a subset of janitors in hospitals saw themselves as part of a larger team whose goal was to heal people. Yes, it's not the most glorious job to clean bedpans and mop up vomit, but this subset of janitors would go the extra mile to brighten up the rooms of the extremely ill and anticipate the needs of doctors and nurses rather than wait for orders. They were able to see their jobs as something greater than just mopping floors, and that, in turn, made their work more skilled and meaningful. An interesting thing to note here is that these perceptions also gave the janitors autonomy, moving work from a have-to to something more self-directed. So that just about sums up our intro to competence and skilled and meaningful work. Effectiveness, skill, growth, and meaning. So we have these five foundations that are not subject to adaptation. Other foundations have been suggested by psychologists and philosophers, particularly nature and health. The only reason they're not included here is the relative uncertainty, compared to the other foundations, of how exactly they affect happiness. There's an argument to be made that health should just be added to security. If insecure health or physical impairment disrupts your life on a daily basis, that's a deep source of unhappiness. And when your health is secure, you don't really think about it. To quote Ben Franklin, we are not so sensible of the greatest health as of the least sickness. But this doesn't seem quite right, at least at the level of intuition. To me, there's an obvious difference between a secure body and an exceptionally healthy one. The latter seems much more likely to be resilient to compression, to produce more peaceful moods and somatic confidence, and result in a greater overall engagement with life. And I'm not sure that's something we adapt to. As for nature, it's not clear why it contributes to happiness. There's obvious contenders like sunlight, movement, and natural beauty, but my guess is that it has a lot to do with leaving the world of control and distraction. Suffice to say, it can't hurt to bring them into your life, and they're likely to be additive to the foundations. Most other things often cited about happiness seem to fit into these categories, but as always, I would love to know what you think. So now we need to connect the dots. We've got a definition of happiness and a set of foundations. Why would these lead to this? First, I think all of them have deep associations with attunement. It can be hard to have a modicum of confidence, tranquility, and uncompression to feel at home in life when you're always under threat. Perceived security is therefore a must. Next, a good outlook should aim to give you peace of mind despite our uncertain and adverse world. Then, if you're not autonomous, that means you're not in charge of your affairs, your life doesn't feel like your own, and you have little to no control over stressors. This doesn't sound like being at home in life. The reverse, being fully autonomous, means everything you do is self-endorsed. You know who you are, you're doing what you love, the environment doesn't impinge on your psyche, and you feel at home with your decisions. Next, it would make sense that profound states of attunement arise when you feel like you matter and belong, as well as when you feel a sense of mastery and growth in your daily life. Finally, it would be hard to feel attuned if you felt that what you were doing had no significance. Moving up to engagement, autonomy and competence lead to flow. If you're doing something you want to be doing and you're optimally challenging yourself, then flow is a natural result. And of course, you'd want an outlook that orients you towards growth. In terms of exuberance, I'm not sure it's possible unless you feel autonomous and secure. It tends to be a state where people are free of insecurity and feeling fully themselves. I think of Jack Black as a prime example of this. I think we can also say that exuberance is a highly social state and one that occurs when you love what you're doing. Finally, we have endorsement, which has infinite possible sources, but two that are potent in my life are the joy of fulfillment after completing a goal and having a good laugh with friends. I've probably missed some stuff here, but I think it's clear why these five foundations have a lasting effect on our happiness.
To conclude this episode, let's talk about three major takeaways. A big long episode wouldn't be good without a bunch of big takeaways. The first is that happiness is not all that complicated. Five foundations, none of which seem all that surprising. You're probably better off focusing on a few important things rather than trying to add, 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 hoping that more things will make you more happy. But just because we narrowed it to five foundations, does that mean these things are easy? Hell no. To say happiness is a choice, like going for a walk is a choice, is to trivialize just how hard it is. Bringing each of these things into your life can take a great deal of work, and after that, a lot of upkeep. The second major takeaway I see here is that these foundations seem to be foundational to a lot of other important stuff as well. When people speak of meaning, for example, they tend to talk about doing things that they love or value. And they almost always talk about contributing to something greater than themselves. When people speak of motivation, they almost always talk about goals they self-endorse. They're also driven to get better at the activities that lead to those goals, and oftentimes, those goals are not strictly selfish and have to do with supporting their family, community, or generating something useful for the wider world. When people speak of virtue and morality, they generally talk about maintaining integrity around their values, about helping others and developing a good character that is competent in relationships and world affairs. In the end, maybe happiness is so bound up with other major driving forces of life that we can't really talk about it unless we talk about them too. And there's one final thing here, which Habern points out and I agree. If these are the major sources, the foundations of happiness, then the view that happiness is strictly an individual pursuit is mistaken. Our lives are deeply intertwined with others in almost every domain. And yes, of course, your individual outlook matters a lot. In my view, as with the Stoics and Buddhists, it is the most important thing. And in that regard, you have more control over your happiness than you think. As the external influence, important, but ultimately, uh, the nature of mind itself is more important. Cultivating inner peace, inner confidence, and inner freedom, as well as cultivating a sense of control over anger, jealousy, arrogance, pride, and obsessive desire and expectations all rely on individual practice and skill. And to a great extent, our outlook influences our experience of the other foundations. Everything falls to the level of perception and interpretation. As the spiritual teacher John Kabat-Zinn says, wherever you go, there you are. And yet changing the environment is obviously important too. I think it's a moral imperative that we reduce needless suffering and increase opportunity where we can and raise the world's standard of living. But when it comes to happiness in particular, I think we should all be very careful of if I were king syndrome. If only I were in charge, then everything would be great and everyone would be happy. The problem is, is if you ask person A, their perfect environment is different from person B, whose perfect environment is different from person C. Therefore, there is no perfect environment. But while there may be no perfect environment, I think it's clear that some environments support our security and psychological needs better than others. Insisting that a person has total control and should just pull themselves up by their bootstraps is just as bad as the total denial of responsibility. To neglect the environment is to oversimplify the phrase, happiness is a choice, to a fault. The context in which you live is also a large part of the story. Your relationships depend a lot on where and with whom you live, as do your opportunities for meaningful and engaging work, your ability to live as you choose, your sense of security and ability to relax and enjoy life, and even your outlook. Yes, you have a lot of choice over these things, but they also aren't totally up to you. To a great extent, they are things we have to pursue together by building better communities and a better society.